In this video, we'll talk about energy flow through ecosystems. It's all standard level content and it's part of C4.2 on transfers of energy and matter. First, let's make sure we have a good understanding of this word ecosystem. So this is all of the living or biotic factors in an environment plus the abiotic things. So all of those living organisms plus abiotic things, water, rocks, sunlight, etc. Organisms are open systems, and that means that matter and energy can enter and exit. Now, ecosystems are not closed systems. This is an example of a closed system where energy can enter, like light energy, let's say, but matter cannot. Now, if we think about the Earth, the Earth is a relatively closed system, but each ecosystem, this desert, that rainforest, this tundra, those are open and resources, matter and energy can enter and exit. Now the primary energy source for most ecosystems is sunlight. So I'm not gonna talk about these weird caves just yet, we'll come back to those, but most ecosystems utilize sunlight as their primary energy source. Now, who's making use of that energy? Well, that is producers. One of the cool things about producers, and these are things like cyanobacteria, plants, algae, they can convert solar energy into chemical energy. So they're using photosynthesis to take that light energy and make things like carbohydrates or amino acids or lipids so that the rest of the food chain can benefit from that chemical energy. Now, what affects the production of those producers? Things like light intensity, and that can of course vary depending on where you're at, whether you're closer to or further away from the equator, or if you're an aquatic plant, how deep you are down into the water, or what kind of conditions are there? Is it cloudy? Is it clear water? Lots of things can affect that, but we wanna be thinking about sunlight as that primary energy source. Now we say for most ecosystems because there are some ecosystems that still have living things in them but they don't use sunlight as their primary energy source and of course I'm talking about caves so much weird stuff happens in caves now it depends on whether caves are open or closed if it's if a cave is open its primary energy source is most likely dead things that flow into the cave so feces detritus like dead de decaying bodies okay so some things can enter into that cave and those organisms in there make use of that energy source for a closed cave these are weird this is mostly going to be chemosynthetic bacteria. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna harness energy from chemical reactions. And so then they form the base of the food chains um, and then they're making chemical energy that the rest of the organisms can utilize. Theme C is all about interaction and interdependence, and nothing shows that better than food chains. So food chains are always going to start with primary producers, and they're going to show us a sequence of feeding relationships. So they'll always begin with a primary producer, and they will also always include arrows, and these arrows show the direction of energy flow. So this arrow shows that the energy contained within the ground is being transferred to the mouse and the way that that energy is transferred is that the mouse eats the grass. Now a lot of students make the mistake of pointing their arrows in the wrong direction. I like to think of this as the grass goes into the mouth of the mouse. So that's how I remember which way to make my arrows point. Now when we get to the final organism in a food chain, it should be something that nothing else feeds on, okay? So in this environment or this example, nothing feeds on this certain species of snake, okay? Grass, mouse, snake are in a feeding relationship like this. If you have to construct a food chain, I recommend you doing a better job than what I've done right now, and that is making sure that you include specific species. But the most likely scenario is that you're given a list of species in a text or in a diagram and please do pick them out of there.
Food chains aren't very realistic. They don't show all of the feeding relationships in an ecosystem. Things like this, this is a food web, show a much more realistic and much more complex set of feeding relationships. Now, we can classify organisms into different trophic levels. That's the level in which they're feeding in a food chain, but it will depend on what exactly they're eating. Let's have a look at this food chain right here. So the carrot, the rabbit, and the fox are in a feeding relationship that looks like this. Now, in this scenario, the carrot is the primary producer, the rabbit is the primary consumer, and the fox would be a secondary consumer. These classifications are what we call trophic levels, okay? So I have these all down here. Now, in this scenario, the fox is a secondary consumer. Let's now consider this part of the food web, the grain to grasshopper to bird to fox route, okay? So I'm just taking a look at this set of feeding relationships. And the food web is a little bit complex, so I've written it out over here as a food chain. Now, in this case, the grain is the primary producer, the grasshopper is the primary consumer. The bird is the secondary or second level consumer. You can use either term. And the fox is the tertiary or third level consumer. So again, depending on what an organism is eating, it's going to determine its trophic level. So we've already talked about one organism, the fox, can be either a secondary or a tertiary consumer depending on its food choice that time. One of the things we typically don't see on food webs are decomposers. Decomposers are um, organisms that get their energy from dead organisms, discarded body parts, or feces. And they're super important because they recycle nutrients. If it weren't for decomposers, all of those important nutrients would be locked up in dead bodies and nothing would be returned to the soil for primary producers to utilize. So everything ends up with the decomposer. We have two types of decomposers. Um, they both do the same job of recycling nutrients. However, their mechanism is a bit different. Fungi like this tend to be what we call saprotrophs, and they're going to digest things externally. So this mushroom here, this fungus, is spraying digestive juices on this dead log. That dead log is getting broken down, and then those nutrients that have now been broken down into small bits can be absorbed by that fungus. So that's digestion happening outside of the body. Detritivores are organisms that are decomposers and the things that they're eating, they're ingesting them and digesting them internally. Okay, so it's the same result. They're eating dead things, they're recycling nutrients. It's just a difference of external and internal digestion. Now, I've been referring to those beginning of the food chain organisms as producers. That's their role in the food chain or in that ecosystem. If we want to talk about them in terms of their metabolism, we refer to these organisms as autotrophs. They're the same thing. It's just these are mostly talked about by like cell biologists and these are mostly ecologists. They're talking about the same organisms. These are our plants, our algae, our cyanobacteria. And what makes organisms like these way cooler than you is that they can take inorganic substances like carbon dioxide and they can synthesize carbon compounds. So they can take inorganic things from their environment and make organic molecules. Molecules. So that's very neat. Now, we know that plants can make things like glucose and carbohydrates. Don't forget that they can also make amino acids, fatty acids, steroids, nucleotides, lots of different carbon compounds here. Now, when we say that they're building carbon compounds, 
that is often anabolic. So what this is going to require is for these organisms to take small molecules and put them together to make larger, more complex molecules. And if you've already studied metabolism and anabolic reactions, you know that these anabolic reactions require energy. It requires energy to make these bonds, okay, to perform these condensation reactions. Now, where that energy comes from depends on what kind of organism and process we're talking about. So these carbon fixation reactions that happen in the Calvin cycle, if you've studied that already, um, that energy is going to come from sunlight, okay? So when we're talking about photosynthesis and making things like carbon compounds, photoautotrophs are going to use energy from light to do that. So photo means light, autotrophs, we already know that. They're using energy from light for these anabolic reactions. Chemoautotrophs are going to utilize chemical reactions to get the energy they need to build these molecules. Now let's just do a quick review of how this might work in a chemoautotroph. They're going to be utilizing oxidation reactions, and at their heart, oxidation reactions involve a loss of electrons. If electrons are getting lost by something, something else is gaining them. So oxidation and reduction happen simultaneously. Let's see how that plays out in iron oxidizing bacteria. Iron is an element that is easily oxidized when it is exposed to air. And so that means iron would be losing electrons. When that happens, okay, that's an oxidation reaction and that is going to release energy. Some organisms can harness that energy that is lost when that oxidation occurs. Okay, so these chemoautotrophs, what they're really good at is they're good at coupling those oxidation and reduction reactions. They're utilizing oxidation reactions that are already happening, and instead of that electron and that energy going somewhere else, they're using that energy for their own processes. So they're gonna use that in ways that are very similar to ATP production and respiration, if you've already um, learned that, or in the Calvin cycle. From that point forward, the metabolism looks very similar. It's just the original source of energy that's a little bit different. So autotrophs are using external energy sources, the sun or chemical reactions. Heterotrophs are getting their energy and their carbon compounds by feeding on other organisms, okay? So we'll focus on these carbon compounds in particular, but they're eaters, okay? Another way that we have talked about these already is that they are consumers, all right? So um, again, autotroph and producer, heterotroph and consumer, it's okay if those words are living closely together in your brain. One of the things that they have to be able to do is to break down those molecules. They need to break down the molecules in the food that they're eating so that they can use those small parts to build their own molecules. And we call that chemical breakdown digestion. Digestion can happen in one of two ways. It can either be internal or external. You are an internal digester. That means you're going to consume materials. You're going to digest them. That means break them down into small parts. Then you are going to absorb them into your bloodstream or your cells, and you'll use them to make new compounds. That's called assimilation. External digesters, they're going to release enzymes. They're gonna spray enzymes on something outside of their body, and that breaks um, whatever that is down into small parts, and then they can absorb those small parts to assimilate or make new compounds. So the difference here is where the digestion is occurring, whether it's occurring internally or externally, um, but both of these are heterotrophic feeding mechanisms. No matter whether you're an autotroph or a heterotroph, you're still going to need to oxidize these carbon compounds during cell respiration because at the end of the day, ATP production is a universal process. All organisms need ATP and all organisms utilize cell respiration to make that ATP. Now, I've shown here the formula for aerobic cell respiration using glucose as a substrate. 
not all organisms do it this way and some organisms that do it that way don't do it that way all the time but in general this is one way in which it can work so you may already know this if you studied this glucose um, and oxygen can be combined to create carbon dioxide and water and the big reason that that's done is to generate this stuff called ATP so in this example glucose is being oxidized to make ATP. That's where the energy ends up. Now, the difference is where this original substrate comes from. Autotrophs are going to make their own carbon compounds, and then they're going to send those carbon compounds right into this process. So here's an example of a photosynthesis formula where glucose is the final product. If you're a photosynthetic organism that's making glucose, it's very cool because you can just send this glucose right on over to where it can be used for cell respiration. So again, the end goal of all of these processes is to create ATP. That's, we gotta keep our eye on that prize there. Again, what um, material organisms are oxidizing to make that ATP just depends. Autotrophs make their own carbon compounds. Heterotrophs have to eat the carbon compounds and then they can use them to make ATP.